Okay, so this is part two of History Lessons with Ben Shapiro. <laughs> um, if you missed part one, I'll leave it linked up in the top there. And, uh, and obviously in the description below as well. And uh, with that being said, let's just continue. In their founding documents, they ask the Arabs to stay. If you read the Declaration of Independence, of the state of Israel, they explicitly say, we want to be a state for all of our citizens. Yes, we're a Jewish state, but we want Arabs to stay. We want them to become citizens. Instead, all of the surrounding Arab countries declare war. Israel is surrounded on every side by how- I love that he keeps flipping the, flipping the, the whiteboard. Hostile states, every single side, right? So you got Lebanon up north, you got Syria here, you got Jordan, you got Saudi Arabia, you got Egypt down here. And then there are a bunch of far-flung states that are also getting involved, right? Morocco was part of the 1948 war. You have a bunch of states oh. that have decided they are going to. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Israel is not in a ideal location with it being water on one end and then surrounded by all these Arab states on the other. To invade and they are going to destroy Israel. Like they're just gonna strangle it in the crib. And they're openly saying this. And not only are they openly saying this, they're telling the Arabs who are living in the Jewish areas, get out and get out of the way so our armies can come in and we can wipe the state off the map. Well, that's not how it ends up, right? The way that it ends up is that the Jews end up basically retaining pretty much everything that's on this map with the exception of the old city of Jerusalem, right? So Jerusalem ends up basically split down the middle. Jerusalem is not controlled by the Jews at this point. The Temple Mount is still controlled by the Jordanians. The way that people speak about this particular period is as if there was a Palestinian state at this point. There was not. By 1964... <laughs> okay, so I'm seeing a common thread that there was no such thing as a Palestinian state. But are the... But there are people that are called Palestinians, right? So is that also an insult or is that or is that because they believe that Palestine was once there and they are the people of Palestine? The Arab states have decided that they need almost a propaganda effort here. So they create the Palestine Liberation Organization. The Palestine Liberation Organization oh. is a terrorist group. So that's what the PLO is, gotcha. And these are the ones that started the terrorist attacks. Group. It explicitly calls for the destruction of Israel. Now you will note, at this point, Israel does not control any of this or any of this. So when they say Palestine Liberation Organization, they mean this whole thing, right? That whole thing is supposed to go away because Israel doesn't even control that at that point. And they're not calling for Palestine to be liberated from Jordan or from Egypt. They're calling for the complete destruction of the state of Israel. Okay, so in 1967, the Arabs mobilized for all-out war. And this includes Egypt, it includes Jordan, it includes Saudi, it includes Syria. This is gonna be the big war where they finally get rid of this nascent Jewish state that how did the Israelis defend all of this? If they were surrounded by all of these Arab countries, who I'm going to assume had a fairly decently sized army, maybe, in each of those places, and they're kind of stuck in that one spot, how did they defend so well? Or, you know, to the degree where they got to stay where they were? is less than 20 years old, right? And this is just less than three decades after the Holocaust. And Israel instead launches a preemptive war. They see this coming. They destroy the entire Egyptian air force on the ground. And in six days, they proceed to take the Golan Heights, which is this area of Syria. Israel takes over the entire Sinai Desert, takes all of Judea and Samaria to the Jordan River, takes all of the Gaza Strip, takes control of the old city of Jerusalem. Right? They do all of this in six days. So the Israelis did this preemptively of the attack so they struck first but they did it in a defensive tactic is that what i'm getting from this because i guess they knew that all of these places were going to come in and attack so they decided to strike first which is why it's considered a miracle by the state of Israel. I mean, it's an unbelievable military performance. So in six days, they take what was going to be the war for their destruction, and they proceed to expand their borders from this tiny thing to this, this, and all of this. Israel then proceeds to give up like all of it, right? So that's what Israel was after those six days. I'm gonna guess it was the six days. They then take over all of that other area into even Egypt. Wow. 
and then they gave it up. So Israel keeps the Golan Heights because that's a military necessity. The UN calls for Israel to withdraw from occupied territories. Now the language here matters if you care about the UN. I don't happen to care about the UN. I think it's a garbage organization. But if you do care about the UN, there's <laughs> uh, Hey, at least Ben's honest about it, right? <laughs> Fierce battle in the mid mid east. Okay, so he doesn't care about the UN, but if you do care, we'll get into it. The resolution put forward by the UN Security Council it calls for Israel to withdraw from occupied territories, not the occupied territories. Now that makes a difference because if it said the occupied territories, presumably it would mean anything Israel won, it would have to withdraw from if you care about the UN, which you really shouldn't. But it says occupied territories, which means subject to negotiations. The sixty seven Arab League summit happens. And they agree in Khartoum, Sudan, on the three no's. No peace, no recognition, no negotiations. And these are the three no's that are going to govern the Arabs all the way through. Basically until now, until the Abraham Accords. These were... Wait. So... They didn't want peace? Wait, what? What was the three no's? Let me go back for a second. Sudan, on the three no's. No peace, no recognition, no negotiations. Okay, interesting. And these are the three no's that are going to govern the Arabs all the way through, basically until now, until the Abraham Accords. These were the three no's that mattered. And this is all the way in 1967. So whenever people talk about there needs to be a two-state solution, why couldn't they have come to an agreement? Because literally one side said, there will be no peace, no recognition, and no negotiation. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you... You know, that's like... Uh... They kind of like wanted to have their cake and eat it too, it seemed like, but that doesn't work like that. Like, if you're not willing to sit down and talk about it or negotiate or whatever, then that's weird. One side has accepted every single peace deal provided to it to this point in time. And one side has said, we will not accept any peace deal. And yet somehow there's a moral equivalency between the two sides. Explain that one. Okay, 73, holiest day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. Everybody is fasting, everybody is praying, and a surprise attack is launched on the state of Israel. The prime minister is Golda Meir. She gets caught completely by surprise. They were warned and they didn't take it seriously. Oh, you guys had a female prime minister. Wow. That's pretty cool. Very interesting. That's uh, very progressive, I would say, back in, maybe back in those days. Israel suffers extraordinary casualties in the 73 Yom Kippur War and then once again maintains or expands its borders a little bit. 79, Camp David Accords. Finally, there's a breakthrough. Menachem Begin takes over. Wasn't the Camp David thing the, the photo that showed Bill Clinton at? But that was in 2000. What? Oh, I think that was Camp David the second or something like that. Okay. Over as Prime Minister of Israel, a very right-wing Prime Minister. There were two major parties in Israel at this time, Likud and Labor. This is the first Likud Prime Minister. And one of the things that he does is he comes to a peace accord with Anwar Sadat, who is the nationalist leader of Egypt. And in those peace accords, Israel gives up the entire Sinai desert. Israel gives up the entire thing to Egypt in return for basically a cold peace. Anwar Sadat is then assassinated. In 1982, the Jordanian monarchy is deeply afraid that the Palestine Liberation Organization is going to overthrow the monarchy. They expel the Palestinians. The Palestinians end up in Lebanon, tens of thousands of Palestinians. Palestinian terrorist groups begin firing rockets over into Israel from South Lebanon. Yeah, so these people that they're referring to as the Palestinians, where are they coming from? I know they're living there, but if there was never a Palestinian state, there was still Palestinian people. And so now they're getting kicked out and sent to the other Arab countries, which from what I gather, the Arab countries didn't want them. So now those Palestinians are like refugees. In 1982, Menachem Begin launches a war in Lebanon. Israel ends up basically going all the way up to the capital of Beirut and nearly occupying the entire country. And then they end up withdrawing under international pressure in what is considered sort of a disastrous war for the state of Israel, as always. Whenever Israel withdraws from a territory, terrorist groups take over and then threaten Israel. This is the constant pattern. No matter, the, the only time this has not happened is with regards to withdrawal from the Sinai Desert. 1987, the Intifada breaks out. This is the Palestinians in the Judea and Samaria region. The reason that I use the terms Judea and Samaria is they are more historically accurate. People call it the West Bank. Why? Because Jordan occupied it, and this is the West Bank of the Jordan River. So the only reason that it's mm. referred to as the West Bank, which is really historically anomalous, right? it's on the east side of Israel, but it's on the West Bank of the Jordan. 
That's a holdover from the time when the Jordanians occupied this entire area. Again, no one cares that Jordan occupied, quote unquote, Palestinian land. Uh, I don't know. Uh, ben is just so funny. We're just like, nobody, nobody cares. Nobody cares, you know? <laughs> and that Egypt occupied, quote unquote, Palestinian land. They only care when Jews occupy historically Jewish land. That's when things start to get really hot and bothered. Okay, so anyway, the Intifada breaks out in 1987. You get these widespread riots and violent confrontations and terrorist attacks all the way from 1987 to 1991. By this time, Yitzhak Rabin has taken over as Prime Minister of Israel and pushed by George H.W. Bush, the government of the state of Israel starts negotiating with the Palestine Liberation Organization, which is a really weird shift considering the Yasser Arafat is a master terrorist responsible for tons of murders on his hand. He at this point... Has so America steps in and kind of forces the Israeli, uh, sorry, was it prime minister or president to then talk to the PLO guy to kind of come to some agreement? He's been expelled all the way to Tunis, right? He's not even in the picture. And Israel brings him out of retirement basically and says, why don't we negotiate with you? And maybe you can make all of this stop. So in 1993, they signed the Oslo Accords and that is where you get Bill Clinton presiding over one of the least successful international negotiations in the history of international politics. The Oslo Accords have been a complete and utter failure. That ends with Yitzhak Rabin, who's this historic general who has been prime minister of Israel a couple of times by this point, shaking hands with a mass murdering terrorist, Yasser Arafat. And this was going to initiate a new period of health and accord, and there was gonna be peace. All that the PLO had to do was acknowledge that Israel existed and had a right to exist, stop educating their children in terrorism and cease the violence. They couldn't do any of those things, right? So none of that happened. Instead, there's an uptick in violence, pretty dramatic uptick in violence after the Oslo Accords. In 1998, Israel again attempts to make some sort of concessions to the Palestinians, this time under the first tenure of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Why, why, does, why does America keep trying to get involved in this situation? Are they like the neutral party where they're just like, they're trying to be the, the, the ear to listen to both sides because both sides can't get to that agreement point? Israel does not want to govern these areas. Israel is not interested in governing millions of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip or in Judea and Samaria. The last thing they want to do is have their soldiers wandering around these dangerous areas or to preside over these areas. All they want, and all Israel has ever wanted, is to separate off from these particular areas and say, listen, you guys rule yourselves. Like, just stop bothering us, please. Okay, and you will see that this is the continued pattern. 2000, Israel engages in the camp. Okay, so this is what I was trying to remember. The Camp David summit, which they said, they did say in the Vox, Vox video that this didn't go over well or something like that. David negotiations. Bill Clinton is still president at this point, and the prime minister of Israel is now a guy named Ehud Barak. And Ehud Barak is a real dove. Ehud Barak wants to make as many concessions as humanly possible, right? This picture here, which is just an unbelievable picture, Bill Clinton and Ehud Barak trying to push Yasser Arafat into negotiating, right? They're all joking, they're all happy and all this kind of crap. Ehud Barak offered everything. Ehud Barak offered complete control over the Temple Mount with just like a little bit of a recognition that Israel has a historic claim religiously to the Temple Mount. Arafat turned it down flat. He offered control over virtually all of Judea and Samaria. He offered control over the Gaza Strip, right? A Palestinian state, boom, done. Arafat does not even negotiate. He just launches a massive round of violence. I remember this because I was actually in Israel right about the time they launched the Intifada and there were suicide bombings on a fairly regular basis. They blew Holy smokes. Would, would Ben have been like in Israel for any particular reason, like maybe for schooling or something like that? That's, I just don't understand suicide bombings and all this unnecessary violence. It's, ugh. Also, is this like the kind of like the police that uh, they were talking about in like the New York cities or the New York area or Brooklyn areas? I remember somebody mentioning the vests because they don't this guy over here. This this guy looks like an actual police, but this guy, he's like. Not quite, I don't think. Up a Sparrow's pizza shop. I was supposed to be at that corner like a couple of hours later. This was a thing that was really scary. It was really violent. Remember, he launched that not after Israel did something aggressive. He launched that after Israel offered him everything he could possibly want 
if he weren't a damned liar who just wanted Israel wiped off the map. Arafat tells Barak, go to hell. Response to Israel's call, peace process, time now. So, if, say this guy, uh, Arafat, did take, uh, take Barak on his offer, would that mean that the section that we had seen where it was like Israel and then Ju uh, Judah or the kingdom of Judah or Judea, he would have all of that section, all of Judea would be theirs, which had, I guess, the Gaza Strip. But he said no, he, he didn't even want to do that. Map. This, again, is the great lie is that there is desire for a two-state solution from the Palestinian side. So far, there has been no evidence whatsoever that this is the case. Okay, 2004, Arafat dies, and Mahmoud Abbas takes over. Mahmoud Abbas is himself a terror supporter. He wrote his entire doctoral dissertation on Holocaust denial and why it's correct. Israel, in 2005... How do you write a paper on that? Like a dissertation on that? <laughs> you're, you're writing against factual information. What? Under the auspices of Ariel Sharon, who's one of the great hawks in Israeli history, right? He was the general in the 1973 war who ended up pushing all the way down close to Cairo. He was called the bulldozer. He's this famous general. He unilaterally withdraws from the Gaza Strip. There are a bunch of Jewish areas right in the northern tip of the Gaza Strip. Jewish soldiers went in and removed Jewish settlements in the Gaza Strip. These are places people have lived for decades. They removed them and they just turned them over to the Palestinians. Hamas, a terrorist group, immediately rushed in and burned everything. They burned the greenhouses, they burned all the Jewish houses, they knocked down all the good infrastructure, and then they just took over the place. But why? If, if those are perfectly good areas that you can now move into, cultivate food in the greenhouse and have living conditions, why would you go and destroy all that? That doesn't make any sense. This is when you start to see uh, and a difference emerging among the Palestinians in terms of governance. You've got Judea and Samaria, the West Bank here. You've got the Gaza Strip here. In 2005, Abbas wins the Palestinian elections, but only because Hamas and Islamic Jihad boycott the elections. Okay, in 2006, after Israel withdraws from Gaza, remember, Israel's not in control of anything here now. Hamas wins an election. So the first move is not, oh, look, Israel wants to make concessions and make peace with us. The first move is, why don't we elect a terrorist group to actually represent us? Okay, in 2008, Israel's response to this is what if we just offer you everything? So Ehud Olmert becomes prime minister of Israel, and he. <laughs> My goodness, it seems like Israel's just trying to throw everybody a bone here, and nobody's taking it. Am I? I mean, maybe it's. Again, I'm not saying that what Ben is saying is incorrect. Again, I have no knowledge of this, but you know, a lot of people were saying that the Vox video is very biased. I was pro-Palestinian, you know uh which fair enough ben could be very much more pro israel which obviously but just in terms of the facts that he's laying out it doesn't sound like what he's saying is like he's just making it up because he's pro israel like it sounds like israel really did <laughs> everything under the sun to try to get this deal made or like some sort of terms of peace or like oh boy proceeds to offer everything to Abbas. He gives him basically the same offer, but better than the offer that Barak gave in 2000. He offers everything. He offers Judea and Samaria. He, he says, we're going to keep some of the big Israeli settlements that exist here, but we're going to give you land swaps. You can keep the Gaza Strip, everything. Abbas does not even bother to issue a counter offer. He just walks away from the table and launches violence. Gaza war begins 2008. Missiles flying in from Gaza. This is the first Gaza war. Israel has to go in in Operation Cast Lead. And this is the first Gaza war. Oh my goodness. Shut that down. 2014, this breaks out again. Another giant rocket attack from Hamas in Gaza. In 2000, like, did he say the first one was 2008? So 2008 and 2014. Yeah, like, I'm alive during all this. How do I not know of any of this? Gaza, Israel has to go back in in 2014 and shut it down. And that brings us to today, 2021, another Gaza war in which Hamas has decided. Oh, there was a third war in 2021? Decided to launch rockets at the state of Israel. The real reason for that has nothing to do with land disputes in Jerusalem. The real reason has to do with the fact that Mahmoud Abbas was about to hold an election in April. He canceled it because he knew he was going to lose to Hamas. As always, the best way to garner support 
when it appears that you're about to go down is to start blaming the Jews and start trying to kill them. You can start an arms race between yourself and Hamas on how many Jews they can kill. So that brings us to where we are right now in 2021. A few decades ago, private citizens used to be largely that. Private, well, what changed? The internet. Okay, so this is Ben's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's ExpressVPN. So I'll play it, but I'll leave a timestamp for if you want to skip it. Think about everything you've browsed or searched for or watched or tweeted. Now imagine all of that data being crawled through and collected and aggregated by third parties into a permanent public record. Your record. Having your private life exposed for others to see. It was something that celebrities used to have to worry about, but nobody else. But now, when everybody is online, every single person is basically a public figure. To keep my data private, when I go online, I use ExpressVPN. With ExpressVPN, my connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server. My IP address is masked. Every time I turn on ExpressVPN, I'm given a random IP address and is shared by other ExpressVPN customers, which makes it more difficult for third parties to identify me and harvest my data. The best part, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. Whether you're on your phone, your laptop, your smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button to get protected. So for example, let's just say I wanted to turn on ExpressVPN right now. I would open up the app, I would get this, boink, and now it is connected. Behold the power of Express VPN. So if you, like me, believe that you're- I actually have Express, or not Express VPN, I have Nord VPN, and I never, <laughs> I never use it. I don't know why. Data is your business. Secure yourself with the number one rated VPN on the market. Visit expressvpn.com today. So Hamas is an actual terrorist group. Fatah, which is the military wing of the Palestinian Authority, is a terrorist group as well, and Islamic Jihad. So you have three terrorist groups running this area right here. And again, Israel has no Wait, what did he say? It was Hassan Hamas, and then what were the other two? Is a terrorist group as well, and Islamic Jihad. So you have three terrorist- So Islamic Jihads, okay groups running this area right here. And again, Israel has no interest in running those areas. It's the last thing that Israel really wants. It's the reason why Israel has not gone and reinvaded these areas or thrown Hamas out. They don't want their soldiers in these particular areas. What Israel has done, because they don't wish to be involved in these full-scale wars, is they've developed the Iron Dome system. So the Iron Dome system is really an incredible piece of technology. Okay, so Hamas has been firing rockets at the center of Israel. Israel is a very, very tiny state. If you were to fire a rocket from the Gaza Strip to Jerusalem, you have about 90 seconds warning before the rocket hits. Tel Aviv, which is up here, if you hit Tel Aviv, that's again a 90 second warning. If wow, holy metropolis, look at this place. There's a lot of like infrastructure for such a small, small location. I personally, I don't think I could live there just because of how much how busy it looks. Um, like I, 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 my plans in the future is to get like, you know, an acre or two of land and just kind of have no neighbors around me be kind of in the wilderness. I do a lot of woodworking. So, you know, preferably have a lot of trees on my land that I could maybe, uh, you know, cut down, carve, do stuff with, but this is impressive. It's very impressive. You're in Ashdod or Ashkelon, which are down here. You're getting like 15, 30 seconds warning before the rockets hit. So Israel develops this incredible technology called Iron Dome. This is what an Iron Dome battery looks like. You can see that they load up the battery with a bunch of essentially anti-missile missiles. That's, that's what they are. There is an enemy rocket that is fired. Israel has these very precise radar systems that track the rocket launch. So enemy rockets, radar system detects the rockets and tracks. Control system emits impact point. Launch fires missiles to intercept. Wow. I would say maybe the Ukraine, or maybe the Ukraine has something like this, but maybe the Ukraine could have benefited from something like this versus the Russian attacks that have been happening. Then there's a control system that estimates the impact point where it's going to hit, and then they fire a launcher to intercept the missile. And it doesn't bother defending against rockets, they're gonna land in the middle of nowhere. They have these batteries that are set up in all of Israel's major cities. Iron Dome is, basically a technological miracle. They're hitting a bullet with a bullet, and they're doing so with no time to basically figure out how to do it. It's right now succeeding at about 90% rate, which means, by the way, that Israel gets to be nicer to Hamas than it otherwise would be, because if all these rockets were actually hitting all the populated areas of Israel, Israel would just eviscerate Hamas. Like any other state, it would have no choice but to- But why does Hamas keep trying if they know that the Iron Dome has a 90% success rate? Yes, you have that 10% where you can get through or, you know, they don't defend, but 
couldn't Israel, because not that they want to, but I mean, Gaza seems like a very, very small place. Couldn't Israel just do the complete opposite and just knock out Gaza? Not to say that the Israelis want to do that, but I'm just saying, like, wouldn't that also be another kind of thing that the Hamas people should be thinking about? Like, we could easily get wiped out as well? Going on the ground and just finish the job, which is why if Hezbollah in the north, right on the, the northern Lebanese border, decides that it wants to launch a war against Israel, they have way... Why are they doing, like, the Hail Hitler sign? more ordinance than Hamas does, and so Israel would be forced to go in full scale and just do what it would have to do. Right? Israel is being incredibly pinpointed about the way that it deals with this conflict. It's dropping knock bombs on top of buildings. They're bombs that basically shake the building and say, get out, and then they bomb the building after everybody gets out. They're calling building managers and telling them to leave. Whoa. So that's what Israel is doing? Is that what he just said? Pointed about the way that it deals with this conflict and it's dropping knock bombs on top hold of buildings. On, on. More ordinance than Hamas does. And so Israel would be forced to go in full scale and just do what it would have to do. Right? Israel is being incredibly pinpointed. Yeah, so Israel, okay. So they drop a warning bomb first and then they drop an actual bomb. About the way that it deals with this conflict and it's dropping knock bombs on top of buildings. They're bombs that basically shake the building and say, get out. And then they bomb the building after everybody gets out. They're calling building managers and telling them to leave. We have tape of them telling building managers, clear the building. And the building manager is being like, well, we don't want to. And the Israeli is saying, well, yeah, but there are kids inside. And the building manager being like, okay, well, if you kill kids, then it's a good propaganda win for us. It's unbelievable. And yet somehow the world sees some sort of moral equivalent there. Now, I mean, that, yeah, that's kind of playing like, uh, what's that? like chicken or whatever you know when two cars drive at each other to see who's gonna move first like you're giving a guy a warning being like hey we're gonna blow your building up and they're like uh it's okay we'll take the risk or i don't know i don't think either way it's a good thing like hamas doing that and then israel israel doing that i understand why israel would be doing that though and they're doing it it seems like at a, a much more compassionate sense i mean they're still destroying people's homes and destroying uh buildings and whatnot but they're not trying to take life which sounds like hamas is trying to do regardless there are some international political implications that have changed in the recent past with regard to israel i've dealt with just specifically here the israeli palestinian conflict but one of the things that has happened that is really quite massive is that if you go back here, Israel currently has a cold peace with Egypt. Okay, before we get any further, uh, I'm going to pause this again. This will be the end of part two. Uh, I'll leave the link for part one uh, at the end of this video. And let's get, and I'll see you guys on the next one, right?